Welcome to OpenBSD and OpenBGPT has a control plane for your ISP. This is a talk uh, uh, for ISPs and for computer network engineers in general and programmers who have an interest in networking. Um, my name is Thomas Smith and I'm the Chief Technical Officer of Wireless Connect. Uh, we're an ISP in Ireland and uh, uh, I'm very I feel very privileged to be here. I'd like to just thank Dan Lanchell and all the volunteers of the BSD can who've made it happen despite all the odds uh, this year and made it an online course. Uh, I also just want to say uh, I'm, I'm a net admin, not a dev, and so um, I haven't written any of the code that I actually actually use and I'm also I don't speak for the open BSD project or any of the BSD projects for that matter um, and I'm very appreciative to the BSD CAN team for allowing me to speak here and by using this software and by building my networks I'm trampling all over the shoulders of giants like Henning Brower, Peter Hessler, Claudia Ecker, Job Schneiders there's so many people in the Sebastian uh, and there's so many people in the OpenBSD project and BSD projects in general that have made my life easier. So all your time and effort has made my life, working life easier. And uh, it allows us to bring uh, high quality networks to rural Ireland and to businesses all over Ireland. So I'm really appreciative of BSD and what it's done for me uh, in my professional career and what it's done for, for uh, my company. Um, I'm an engineer and a business owner. I like the road less travelled and uh, I suppose I love the path to, to understanding and solving problems. Uh, you know, it's, if you can understand a problem, you can solve it. That's my kind of, I suppose, my approach to life. Um, I've been working in uh, IT since 2000, so 20 years. And I started consulting in 2005 and I set up an ISP with my best friends from college. And I haven't looked back since, so... Um, uh, when I started, I started with Unix, I suppose it would be uh, back in 1998, I suppose I got a taste of it with Linux, uh, thanks to Dr. Barry McMullen. Um, Tom and BSD, I used FreeBSD actually as an admin or as a user um, uh, with VPS hosting for customers that we had uh, around 2003-2005. Um, I enjoyed it, I, I liked the OS. I used OpenBSD then, started using OpenBSD as an SSL terminator um, because of hosted D and relay D's naming convention. I didn't realize they had one in base and I actually ended up using uh, Stunnel in front of uh, uh, my pr reverse proxies in front of my sites. Um, and I gradually increased usage across my ISP um, in terms of like pretty much now we're running DNS recursive um, resolvers and authoritative resolvers using the NSD and Unbound, which is in OpenBSD base, which is great. Um, Open NTPD for maintaining time, which is critical for any timer-based uh, protocols for routing, like such as OSPF, and, um, and, and also for keeping, obviously, logs consistent. Uh, we use Open SMTPD uh, for SMTP relaying for our clients and our customers uh, for alerting for you know outages and stuff like that and alerting for uh, alert conditions on our routers. I have to say it's a phenomenal, um, uh, phenomenal simple program and the syntax is lovely and uh, comparing it to the likes of SendMail I, I just found it a lot nicer to use and um, thanks to Yields and all the lads, uh, all the people who work and contribute to that. Um, I also use OpenBGPD uh, for this talk uh, as a control plane for our ISP and also as a looking glass. Uh, we use that for our support staff as well so that they can uh, query the routers really easily without having to log in and stuff like that and they can check to see if everything's okay uh, and do some rudimentary diagnostics obviously for our customers as well. Um, we use OSPFD and OSPF60, um, and we also use OpenBSD as uh, you know, into use, uh, so network termination units uh, for client premise equipment, so that we can uh, validate the uptime for business customers, uh, and uh, provide some filtering services for the business customers. Uh, so why do we use OpenBSD or OpenBGPD? Well, you can't fly like an eagle or soar like an eagle if you're flying with turkeys. So. Uh, I liked the, 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 the attention to detail 
I like the like in terms of the design, the documentation, and the implementation. And um, like, uh, um, thank you, Ingo, and all the people who focus so um, so strongly on on quality documentation. And uh, Ingo has had some very interesting talks at BSD Can and Euro BSD Can talking about how you know if you actually document something properly, you can identify errors in logic in the programmer's understanding of the problem. Um, and uh, you know. I find that the syntax is very brief yet profound and I can even see that, you know, we often witness that on the tech mailing list where people are discussing the naming of functions, like is it communicating the proper meaning for a user and I think that's just, uh, it's just amazing. Um, and I, I, I love it. Um, in terms of uh, stability, security, obviously, you know, these are all names are synonymous or, you know, descriptions that are synonymous with uh, OpenBSD. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it was also confidence in knowing that if something goes wrong, chances are it's something I have done, or maybe there's an external condition such as, you know, connectivity problem, uh, backhaul attenuation if someone digs up a fiber cable, um, uh, and connectivity to third parties, you know, you know if there's a, a third party connectivity is or something there, having that confidence that your equipment is doing what it says it's doing and doing what you're asking it to do. If you're asking it to do the wrong thing, you can fix that. Your team can fix that. Your team can work together with it. If it's been, if your system has been honest with you, is it actually telling you what it's doing, or is there, a, um, is there a distance between what it's saying and what it's doing? And that, that for me, uh, you get tired of that. It gets pretty old very quick when you're using other systems that might necessarily have that same. Uh, uh, alignment of uh, configuration versus um, versus what's actually what the equipment is actually doing for you and uh, uh, what I'll be discussing today um, I'll be discussing a high level overview of a network root and fundamental a routing fundamental crash course BGP in about 60 seconds and recursive routes in about two minutes and uh, we'll then go through the whole control plane and data plane what we mean by that. Um, I'll talk about OpenBGPD and how we used it. So the challenge. Um, the challenge was to manage, what we wanted to do is manage our network routing with OpenBSD and OpenBGPD. Um, you know, goes without saying, the syntax, the simplicity, security. Uh, I wanted to kind of stop worrying about the network. Um, I wanted to make that business as usual changes didn't actually cause an issue for other clients as you were onboarding a new client. Um, and I wanted, I was kind of getting tired of uh, closed source products and uh, software quality issues with the same. Um, and I also wanted to achieve multiple line rate speeds with that would scale. So, you know, when you're using software routers, you have a limited number of network interfaces. And as you try and add further interfaces um, for other customers, your, your load is going to increase. And uh, so we kept running into bottlenecks with our software routers. So that was partially the reason why we wanted to change. So the solution we arrived at was um, OpenBGBD plus Arista uh, hardware switches. Um, so the Aristas in, on the picture there that you see are um, uh, Arista 7050 uh, QX32s. Um, so like in terms of the uh, flexibility of OpenBSD, it was like that we had, like now we can get RPI, RPKI uh, root validation. We can also get to deny advertisements by default with RFC 8212. Um, and we can, <coughs> the max prefix out limit uh, feature, which uh, Claudio uh, implemented uh, just in 6.6 uh, in current and 6.7 release, um, is just uh, brilliant. And thank you, Claudio, for doing that. Uh, I should have tested that more for you, but uh, sorry, my bad. But uh, it's, it just, it, the max prefix limit out just, uh, it saves you. It's uh, your last line of defense if, for instance, you make a mistake in your routing filters. Uh, we've all done it at one stage or another, so uh, I would like to minimize the impact of it. So it just limits the impact of those uh, fat finger F-ups. So uh, in terms of, uh, so then we also couple that 
with uh, the Arista 7050 QX. So no software router is going to compete with, let's say, hardware switches or in terms of forwarding performance. So what we wanted was a bit of flexibility in how we manage the network uh, and a bit more control. Uh, but we also wanted to have um, uh, high speed and more scale. So like if, if with uh, the Arista 750, for example, in our configuration, we get uh, 96, 10 gig ports uh, in one U. It's pretty savage, like, you know, um, and that, that makes a massive difference. So, you know, you're talking about 2.5 uh, terabits per second and uh, 1.4 uh, billion packets per second. So it's pretty nice. And the latency is, you know, half a, half a microsecond, which is pretty, pretty nice as well, you know, so. Um, in terms of the VM specs, like it was, uh, you know, we, we started using it at OpenBSD 6.3 in terms of when we started trying to control our network more and more with OpenBSD and OpenBHBD. Um, so we used just, a, we installed OpenBSD in the KVM. Uh, you know, we were talking about two cores, so very modest config, um, two Vertio NICs for redundancy uh, for connecting to, to two different layer two and layer three networks effectively. Uh, and then just one management NIC uh, for, um, we used six gigs of RAM initially, but we started to kind of, you know, we were approaching memory limits. So we decided to just bump it to eight, gig, eight gig. Uh, so we've actually, you know, put it to eight gig at present. That's what we're running on our uh, BGP uh, root reflectors. Um, in terms of KVM optimizations, just if you're ever doing it, uh, we increased the tap uh, queue size uh, to 8,000. So the default one is uh, 1,000. So that's the tap, that's the interface that links the virtual NIC of the, the, the computer to, the, to the, um, the underlying hypervisor forwarding uh, plane. Uh, so instead of having it at 1,000 bytes, which would be the default, we used 8,000 bytes. And that's particularly useful if uh, the router is busy or if your VM is busy and is not able to process the package when the hypervisor sends it to it. Um, you'll find out if you need that is if you look at the TX drops on, on your interfaces on your hypervisor. If you're seeing TX drops on your tap, then that queue will help you just smooth out those uh, microbursts. Um, uh, and it'll just help you a little bit. Uh, we turned off uh, kernel same page merging uh, because it's it's pretty much useless on OpenBSD uh, for OpenBSD guests because of the kernel address space layout randomization, Carl, uh, and also the uh, ASLR and all that type of cool tech uh, security mitigations that uh, OpenBSD have implemented. The high level design, what we ended up with was two root reflectors, two OpenBSD BGPD routers uh, v uh, running in KVM VMs. And then we had two Arista switches uh, with a multi chassis lag between them. And then we had two other Aristas which were uh, set up um, uh, to, to be our routers. Uh, so the reason why we did that, as in used four Aristas instead of two, is that you can optimize um, the Trident chipsets in it, the Trident 2s, uh, to basically be either optimized for layer two operations, like you know tunnels and all that type of stuff, or layer threes, uh, three setups where you're actually using them for routers. So, so what we wanted was, we wanted uh, an extensive layer two setup within our data center, but we also wanted to have um, the routing capability. So, we just said we'd, we'd yeah, use the two. I have to say they're pretty impressive um, with what they have. In terms of IP routing, so now what we've kind of just said, I've kind of painted a picture of what we do, um, but now I kind of want to talk about the logic behind the design and why we do it that way. So if we look at IP routing, it's basically for a packet that you're sending to a given destination. So a packet comes into your router or, or is originating from your computer, it has a destination IP. You will forward the packet to another device so that it will hopefully reach the end destination. And so you're routing a packet based on its destination. You don't look at the source, you don't do any of that. Um, and one of the concepts that are really important is longest prefix match. So if you have a, a more specific route, so a smaller network, 
and the packet that's destined for a device inside those networks that are referenced in your routes, then you will forward it to whatever the, the one that is the most specific. Um, and the simplest way of even talking about it is longest prefix match. So the bigger the number in the CIDR notification, that's the slash, the number after the slash in your routes, uh, as we often talk about as network engineers, um, the, the, the more likely that that route will actually be picked or that route will be picked. So if, if we have an example where we have a routing table with 0 to 0 to 0 slash 0, the default route, pointing at 10.1.2.3, and we have 8.8.8.0 slash 24, a common network that most people would know who's, who runs that, um, and that's going to 10.1.2.4. We can, if we want to then send a packet to 8.8.8.8, .8 so Google's DNS, we'll, our device will use, um, what, which next hop would it use? Well, it would use the uh, 10.1.2.4 route. Why? Because it's, it's more specific, it's a longer prefix match. So just, um, <coughs> so if we look at talk about direct uh, routes and direction of traffic flow, so one route on its own is a unidirect. It'll allow you to forward traffic unidirectional. So uh, unidirectionally. So what do we mean by that? Is that um, routes? It'll route based on the destination, and routes learned by you. So if you have a route in your laptop or router, it will forward traffic out. It'll upload. So that would be like your upload on your computer. Routes learned by everyone else about you, that's your download traffic. Um, and that's a really just, it's an important point and it's one that is a fundamental principle behind how this uh, architecture worked well for us in our network. Um, if you're talking about internet conversations, it's something that maybe a lot of, a lot of non-network engineers kind of take for granted. In order for an internet conversation to happen, like bi-directional communication, hopefully, um, not like monologues that uh, people will probably complain about Tom when he's talking to them. Sorry about that, guys. Everyone. Um, so one of the things you'd be looking at is, uh, so how do you, you, you need to route correctly to the other party. The other party needs to route correctly to you. And then all the routers in between you and the other party need to route the packets correctly in both directions and those paths to and from the other party can be different and invariably are different on the internet. So uh, so if we're talking about border gateway protocol it allows different organizations so now we've, we've kind of dealt with the routing um, the routing setup now let's talk about border gateway protocol and what it is. So it's the people describe it as the glue that links the internet together or makes the internet happen. Um, what I like to think of it is that it allows organizations who run networks, uh, independent organizations who run networks to exchange a list of networks that are reachable via their network. So they would advertise their own networks to their peers and they would advertise their customers to their peers. And that is replicated according to standards um, with the BGP protocol across the internet. And that's how it has grown organically um, since its inception. Uh, if we talk about each organization, they will have at least one label um, called an autonomous system number or an AS number. Uh, for instance, I run AS. 60129, formerly AS1988, um, um, and uh, it's just an, it's a label that says uh, that people can identify the routes that I'm originating, as in advertising out that are specifically on my network, and they can also identify what routes are transiting through my network. So at the boundary of each AS, we uh, routers will exchange network layer reachability information uh, or NLRI using BGP. Um, so at the boundary of each AS, um, basically lists of networks or prefixes in CIDR, so that's uh, classless internet interdomain routing. Or, um, so basically it's, it's not the old class ABCs of, you know, um, you know, where the subnet masks are either 8, 16, or 24-bit. 
and so they decided to use variable length subluxed masks which would allow you to it actually allowed the IPv4 internet it kind of gave people more time to move to IPv6 in which people like me just used the time to uh, do nothing sorry guys sorry everyone um, but yeah so in terms of what it does um, uh, you, you're <coughs> you're basically saying here's a list of networks like 8.8.8.0 slash 24 and it's reachable via mine AS like for instance Google's AS number uh, 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 15,169 um, and uh, you can see in this example where I actually show I query the BGP uh, router with the BGCTL uh, command um, you can actually see that I have four paths to um, to Google's D, uh, to Google's uh, DNS servers um, and uh, two transits and two via my local awesome internet exchange INIX. Shout out to those great people who uh, run uh, that organization and the network, which has been a massive improvement and help to my company. And uh, I couldn't help but recommend you, if you have a network or you're, you're operating an enterprise network or a content delivery network or um, an ISP, certainly consider uh, joining your local internet exchange. If you don't have them, maybe uh, you maybe talk to uh, the good folks at INX or EuroIX who can help you make big latency. So we're peering with Google and from our data center, uh, you know, it's less than a millisecond latency to Google's DNS. So we're quite fortunate in Ireland with our connectivity. And, uh, and I think a large part of that is due to the work of the people at INX uh, on our network. So I just, just big shout out to them um, if they're watching. Um, so uh, this is a so this protocol allows the internet to be somewhat decentralized and grow. We've already said that, um, and it works well most of the time because of well-intentioned, vibrant community of well-intentioned engineers. Um, and then there's a number of activists and visionaries that try to lead us to a better place to address some of the flaws in it. Um, and Yab Schneiders, uh, who works, uh, you know, with Claudia Yecker on OpenBGPD and on the project, um, it, it, you know, people like that. You know, watch what they're doing, watch what they're saying, uh, and trying to understand what they're saying and implement it on your network. Um, so BSB, BGP at an ISP edge, if we're talking about it. Uh, basically, uh, for my router, so my AS to, let's say, my transit provider. So I'm AS62129, and then my one of my transit providers is Cogent AS174. So what I need to do is... Uh, I want to get download traffic from my transit provider. So what I need to do is advertise the list of networks that are reachable via my network, uh, via my router. So I do that with BGP. So I push advertisements to uh, uh, Cogent and Cogent then hopefully accept them because they're valid and uh, program those routes into their routers and replicate that out to all their customers. And because of that, um, because I've advertised my routes out, I'll start getting traffic coming into my network. So the simple act of just advertising a handful of prefixes, which is about the amount I have on my own network, that allows me to get all my download from my ISPs, ISP. Um, and then the upload traffic, that's a slightly different matter, So, uh, but it's just the... It's just the reverse. So uh, Cogent or AS174 will advertise the prefixes that are reachable via it. And uh, I will accept them if they're valid and not, uh, you know, um, and in any way um, wrong. And uh, I program my routers with those routes. And if I do that, then I will upload traffic. I'll start to upload and route traffic out. So download is basically advertising routes to other people and your upload is learning routes from other people. So as you just bear that in mind. And so on the local internet exchange and a heavy influence on what I did on my own ISP was lear making learning lessons from the likes of INEX and the people who run it. Uh, let's talk about internet exchanges. So an internet exchange is, uh, for the want of a better description, simple it's a switch with a load of routers connected to it and each one of those routers would advertise bgp to everyone else 
Now the problem is that you get an n minus one squared um, uh, problem in that if you have a hundred and one uh, routers on an exchange, you need to have about ten thousand sessions established and configured on on all one hundred routers in order for every member to exchange traffic. So each pay, each router needs to appear with everyone else. Um, root servers were designed to minimize this load and uh, it's quite nice. So if you see here, for instance, there's a, a Hurricane Electric AS6939 and then Google. So Hurricane Electric obviously you can see uh, has access to Google servers or how can Google servers are reachable via Hurricane Electric. So they advertise that to the root server. But so are Google on the exchange and they advertise those same prefixes to the root server. So we have all these other ISPs um, advertising their routes to a particular root server. So they have a session that's established with the root server. And then the root server kind of aggregates all these routes and uh, filters them, which is a very good security compo uh, uh, component of an internet exchange. And it's why OpenBGBD and Bird, uh, those people want, uh, the people who run internet exchanges, wanted improved software for improving uh, security to stop mistakes on member servers, uh, member routers uh, causing internet leaks and stuff like that. So the root server actually aggregates all this, filters all the prefixes learned, and then re-advertises it to everyone else who's peered with it. And uh, what's interesting about this is that by doing that, the traffic actually flows between the members through the switch, but not through the root server. So the root server is absolutely critical for the, uh, the control of the data flow, but it's not actually, uh, actually forwarding the data in the data flow. Uh, you know, that's left to the layer two switches in the uh, internet exchange fabric and it's left to the individual members. So effectively what the root server does is it says, hey Tom, your network wants to get to Google's DNS servers, go to Google's DNS IP, Google, Google's router IP on, on the LAN there. And if it direct, redirects people to that, and that, and that uh, just, or it directs routers where to send the traffic to, will probably be a better way of describing it. So, that's kind of where we're getting on to. So how do that, and that's why we started to use it in our own ISPs that I wanted, well, maybe I can apply similar logic uh, using switches in layer three in my own ISP. Uh, so BGP also comes in two flavors, and that's just something to, to be aware of. So you have eBGP, which is, eBGP and iBGP on the wire look very similar. So in between eBGP, you'd have two different uh, AS numbers on the peering session. So one router from one AS, another router from another AS. And so that's an external BGP session, okay? And then you have to have an internal BGP session where you have two routers with the same AS number. So all the routers within my own organization will be running IBGP between each other. Um, and then the routers between my organization and another one would be running I um, eBGP. So um, so if we look at standard routes, so I just kind of, we, we talked about it, you know, forwarding a packet to a next top that's usually directly reachable uh, via connected route. Um, like, so for instance, let's say for this example, we've got uh, a network 1.2.3.4 that's reachable via the blue router on the right hand side. So if we take a, if that's propagated out um, via OSPF or, or some other routing protocol, what we'd be familiar with is that 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 on the yellow router would be reachable via 5 to 6 to 7 to 8. And then on the first uh, green router, it would be routable via, uh, you know, 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 would be routable or would be routable via 6 to 7 to 8 to 9 and so on and so forth. So you can see that you've a, you know you've a host directly reachable and you can forward the traffic to it. Okay, so that's your standard routes, and then there's the concept of recursive routes. So the recursive routes are just uh, just we're building on it a bit. It's where the next hop is in BGP. The next hop doesn't really change. So uh, the next hop will be if it's learned from an external 
like, oh, hey, I got this prefix from Cogent or AS174. I remember the Cogent gateway throughout my network as being the, re the that's where I need to send the packet to to get to that destination. So the problem with that is that on the yellow router, it's not directly connected to the router that's advertised in 1.2.3.4. So the way we actually get around that is we supplement the IBGP route with an OSPF route, okay? So, uh, so the blue routes are what we're learning through IBGP and the green routes in the diagram are what we're learning through OSPF. So we actually use the IBGP route plus, sorry, the, plus the OSPF route or a static route it may be um, or some other IGP route and that allows us to get to the final destination. So it's just a little uh, nuance that uh, I have to say at first kind of wrecked my head, um, but uh, you get used to it. You, you kind of, you get Stockholm syndrome or something and you kind of think it's okay. Um, so um, if we look at recursive routes, the supplementary route, so you get learn via IBGP, but you need to also learn an additional route via uh, static or OSPF or ISIS, or, uh, or uh, RIP. I'm not endorsing ISIS or RIP or anything like that. I've never used them. Um, so recursion is actually more common than you think. So this concept, and just to give you a kind of a simple example. So if we looked at a router here, we have a default gateway of uh, 10.20.30.1. So if I want to route to somewhere that's not directly connected to my router or computer, I would use the default gateway. I need to send the traffic to the default gateway in order to get it to its final destination or hope that it gets to its final destination. In order to do that, what we do, well, we actually need to know, well, how, how do we construct a frame that would actually reach our default gateway? So we need an ARP entry, so, or a host route. So, um, and OpenBSD, one of the things I like about it, um, and you know, is that you see that you see the host routes or the ARP entries as host routes, and you see that 10.20.30.1 is reachable via E4, 8D, 8C, uh, 1C, 16.64. And so you can actually see that. Uh, so just remember that your default route isn't enough. You actually need the ARP entry for your default route to get out. Uh, to its final destination, hopefully get to its final destination. Uh, the reason why I use hopefully is that it's not guaranteed. You know, you need a lot of other things to work for that to happen. Um, um, so if we look at the recursing through routes, just an example from our network, and uh, uh, I've kind of modified the net, the IPs for simplicity of reading, um, but you can see here that we have 8.8.8.0.24. So I'm asking BGP... Uh, CTL and uh, BGP CTL to give me like what routes has it learned via BGP uh, and this would be like our routing information base or like a list of routes that are available and we see that we have four routes for 8.8.8.0 and uh, we can see that some of them are learned directly from Google because they're on the same internet exchange as we are and we also learn them through, via two transit providers so you see 174, AS 17. So you see the AS path, and the AS path is a nice, interesting uh, thing in BGP that allows us to select routes, hopefully based on the shortest path between uh, the shortest AS path, so the sh short to reduce the number of tr networks we're transiting through. Um, and you can see that while uh, one to two to three to four, five and four to five to six to seven, so the routes in blue, black. Um, um, red and yellow, they may not necessarily be directly reachable via my router. So that's it's an important thing to understand. So in that situation, what we want to do is we want to uh, we need to learn supplementary routes. So if we actually look at the other routes, we know that one dot two dot three dot zero slash twenty four is reachable via two gateways, and you'll actually see that four to five to six to zero slash twenty three is reachable via two gateways. And we also see that um, uh, 8.9.10.9 is reachable, or you know, or 8.29 is reachable via two gateways. And then the, the routes in blue there, the 11.12.13.0.28, they're reachable by the same gateways. So what you're seeing here is obviously I have two links from this router that I ran that command on. 
and uh, I have two gateways 10.10.10.2 and 10.11.11.3 and that, that pretty much replicates what we have in production. Uh, we have two routers, uh, two gateways with two layer 2 networks um, uh, to two separate layer 3 gateways in case there's an OSPF problem or there's an issue with a switch or something like that. So we try to do that on, on both lands. So the routing information base versus the forwarding information base. So what I'm trying to show here is that um, when you actually query the routing information base, or the, sorry, the forwarding information base, so root minus T0 minus N show, that's actually querying what's programmed into the kernel. And we see that 8.8.8.0 slash 24 is reachable. I'm not too fond of the way it displays uh, in the output of the routes, but you can see that it's 10.10.10.2 is the gateway. So it's already resolved. If I go back one slide, sorry, this. It's already resolved that, um, it, you know, it's reachable via, you can see the selected route, the valid one, which is, uh, you know, the first route on the list. And you can see all the flags. So if you want to see the flags, it's helpful. BGP CTL will actually show you the flags of which route it was selected. And you can actually also see that the kernel, sorry, that the kernel has actually uh, selected that route for you and pre presented and shown it to you, the forwarding information base. So that the forwarding information base is just the routes that are selected and programmed into your kernel or your routing hardware, if you have if you have such. Um, so switch strengths, what like what are the, the strengths of switches? Well, they can forward in hardware at line rate, in terms of conditions apply. Uh, some packets are sent to the CPU um, for inspection. Uh, filter, it can also filter packets in hardware at line rate, but it's generally IP header filtering. So, it's, you know, you can't do stateful inspection and stuff like that in hardware on the switches that you typically would ha you'd try this on. Um, <clears throat> our network, so for the forwarding capacity, the, the huge forwarding capacity, and in our network we use four Arista 7050QX32s, uh, 9610 gigs and one rack mount unit, which is amazing, and I, I think I already went through the 2.5 terabits and 1.4 billion packets per second, so that's the reason why we did but there are limitations to switches. Uh, ASICs and switches have a finite memory capacity for forwarding packets and frames and remembering which destinations to send to what port or what next top. And that's important. Um, and this memory is TCAM, 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 TCAM. And it's so important. And it's one of the things that when you're looking at a switch, not all switches were created equal. Um, you know, you will have an upper limit on uh, what max uh, MAC addresses it can learn if it's a layer 2 switch or host routes if it's a layer 3 switch and even, indeed what max maximum number of access control lists can it handle the access control list will be allowing you to do your filtering um, and not all switches were uh, optimized uh, were all not all switch profiles were created equal forgot the equal there but it's uh, optimized for either layer 2 or optimized for layer 3 and that's why we ended up going with 4 so we had a pair of switches that were optimized for layer 2 operations and then we had another pair of switches that were optimized for layer 3 operations. Um, know your hardware usage, make sure that your switch vendor, um, whoever you choose, has uh, the ability to show you how much TCAM space you're using. Um, you know, and in this case, like you can see here, we are, we're consuming about 102,000 routes in our setup. So this is just taken yesterday from from one of our routers um, out of a possible 393,000 uh, 393, routes. So that's a pretty, a pretty nice uh, switch um, and they do have quite a big capacity. Um, and the way they do that is they use ALPM, which is algorithmic longest prefix match. So um, Arista allows you to tune the, the TCAM profile for routing. And that in that case, when we use ALPM, uh, where we can get more uh, routes um, programmed into the TCAM. The, the ALPM limit, upper limit, is shared between your IPv6 and your IPv4 routes, 
So when you're moving to IPv6, which you should be doing, uh, you just need to be mindful, like what I would do, start off easy and just see how many routes uh, you add in with IPv6 and how much actual um, TCAM space is it chewing up. Um, so if we analyze the route table, which is why I wanted to analyze the IPv4 internet routing table, was I wanted to see how many routes can I program into these switches. We know they're limited, so how do we do it? Um, so I, I, I did a, a god-awful script uh, that pretty much just did a grep minus C on um, my root table um, as programmed or learned by my routers um, and just to get an idea of what sort of um, prefix count we had. So with the routers that we have, we have one default root, we have 10 slash 8s, 11 slash 9s, and these are all obviously very large networks, you know, slash 8. The smaller the prefix number, the much larger the network it would be. Uh, and then what you actually start to see is that a dramatic increase from slash 21s through to slash 22s and 23s and 24s, you actually see the bulk of networks being in, let's say, slash 24s and slash 22s. So we see quite a, quite a lot of uh, prefixes. If you were to add all of those up, that's 815,000 routes. It's... Uh, it uh, won't fit in our switch, so we need to do something. Now, one of the nice things we can to remember is that this is all just for my upload traffic. So my download traffic is taken care of by advertising. So as a, an eyeball ISP or an ISP where users are consuming data, uh, connecting to other websites, connecting to other people on the internet, um, the, the, this is not a huge issue for us. Uh, we you know we're so we're getting lots of download and we just now need to deal with the upload and that's what programming our TCAMs is about is getting an optimal uh, flow for our upload traffic. Um, so if we look at our TCAMs, can hold three hundred ninety three thousand routes roughly, um, but it'll be shared across four classes of routes. So your IPv four uh, unicast routes, your IPv six unicast. And then obviously you have your uh, IPv4 multicast and IPv6 multicast routes as well to worry about. Um, our, also, our hardware switches also will need to peer directly with networks on our local internet exchange. So not all other ISPs will want to establish uh, the type of sessions where they would actually connect directly to my open VGPD routers. And in that case, I would actually need to, to use my Aristas to... Um, to to learn the, the, the to learn other people's uh, prefixes directly on the Arista switch uh, on the exchange through the root servers and through direct bilateral peering uh, relationships. Um, we can also you can find out how many prefixes are needed to an exchange you're joining. Look at your peering DB. Look at the peering DB entries for that exchange. Look at their looking glasses. These looking glasses basically give you a view of of how many advertisements or how many routes are being learned and advertised and distributed by your root servers on your you know prospective um, internet exchange. So in this one, we can see from live data just from yesterday from one of my routers. That there's about 65,000 routes on INX LAN 1. So it's about 66,000 routes in total. Okay. Um, and you can see that I have two sessions with there because they have two root servers for redundancy, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then obviously, if we look at INX LAN 2, there's like uh, we're learning about two and a half thousand routes on that one. So you can see it in red highlight of the prefixes received. And we're accepting all the prefixes we received because INX have filtered them for us, uh, which is great. Um, and we want, so summary of requirements now that we've done a bit more analysis. So we have 66,000 routes on INX LAN 1, we've got 2,500 on uh, uh, INX LAN 2, so we've about 70,000 routes that we need to program directly onto our switch. And that's going to vary from time to time, so you just need to track that as new users join your internet exchange or new ISPs join your internet exchange. And we also want to have space for IPv6 addresses, which we should be using already. And uh, thankfully that's a smaller number, it's 89,000 routes for the entire routing table, as opposed to 800,000 routes at the IPv4 internet. 
Um, it is also worth noting that the IPv6 will chew up more TCAM than an IPv4 address. You know, they're bigger, bigger networks. Um, so just to be aware of that, so start small in when you're doing it and then progressively increase your, your, um, your, the routes that you're allowing into your hardware switches so that you're not overrunning your TCAM tables. Uh, if you look at it uh, in terms of, uh, we need so 70,000 for the internet exchange, about 90,000 for IPv6, and likely we have, but, but we have a 393,000 route capacity. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's allow 50,000 routes from transit plus default into our router. So that's what we wanted to learn. And so how we did that, so we did the analysis uh, and what we can see is that there's about 39,000 routes uh, shorter than the slash 18. So, the, the, so from slash 8 to slash 18 plus default is about 40,000 routes in total. So in that, that kind of gave us our benchmark. So if we compare, why would we want to use full tables versus default routes? It's something I haven't discussed. And the full tables will be, it allows for a granular uh, view of what networks are available from a given transit provider. So they're very helpful in diagnosing issues. They're also very helpful in diagnosing the path, like what path does a, 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 a particular packet would take when you send it to a particular ISP. So not all transit providers were created equal. Uh, some will have shorter ASPs paths than others. Um, the disadvantage of it uh, is that obviously it has higher memory requirements, higher hardware requirements, higher uh, processing, and it's longer to convert. So when you start a B2B session with a default route, it'll come up pretty much immediately. Um, while a routing, you know, when you're trying to pull in 800,000 routes, filter them, install them in your route table, that takes a bit more time. Uh, typically under a minute in our network, um, in around that. Um, so you can see, verse, you know, a couple of seconds versus a minute, it's a, it's a fairly big change, you know, it's at least an order of magnitude. Uh, if we look at, let's say, the default route, uh, the problem is that you have a very coarse failover of traffic. So it's either all or it's off. That's, that's your failover event. Uh, even if, so uh, what, what, uh, that's why having two tables uh, being able to gradually fail over. So you may prefer one ISP, but per, maybe a network like Yahoo is not available from your preferred ISP. You can just direct the traffic that's not available to be your preferred ISP via your second ISP, which might be a slightly more expensive for transit it costs. So there's no visibility with default routes, and it's, but it's faster convergence time. So what I wanted to do was to reduce the risk, so to reduce the risk of black hole and traffic. So what we said was, let's accept large networks. So if someone's advertised a slash eight, chances are they're fairly big. Um, and it's an assumption, it's not always translates into reality, but the, you know, you have a lot more IPs in it, the probability is that they will use uh, more traffic. So uh, at least we're actually comparing all the very big networks down to slash 18s. Um, and then what we do is we summarize the 19 to slash 24s as a default route. So that's, but we also use the routes, all the routes from the internet exchange, they're programmed directly into the switch hardware. So at least we have all the, the local traffic is being granularly routed and failed over and preferring in naturally the, the actual uh, the, the internet exchange. If we want to learn routes that um, from our internet exchange and we want to accept pushing it into other hardware routers in our network, on our external routers facing those uh, particular exchanges, we need to paint the, the routes so that we know this is learned from a local exchange, please accept it and push it into the TCAM, even though it's a very specific small route. And so what we do is we use BGP set community commands for that. So in our Arista routers, we had we used the AS number for the INEX AS number, which is uh, 43,760. And we just basically tagged any routes learned from their root server on LAN1 as 43,760 colon one. And we set the community for any any routes learnt on INX LAN two as forty three thousand seven hundred sixty colon two. So that was just, and then 
Our open BGPD routers, what we did was we said, right, how do we limit our transit? Um, how do we limit what networks we're learning from transit so that we don't overrun our TCAMs? And it's very simple. We just say, we allow, we by default, we drop every, all the prefixes going into the, uh, the re restricted FIB routers, the hardware routers in our organization. And then, with as you can see highlighted in red, we basically say we'll allow any prefix from 8 to 18. So that covers that range of prefixes we want to allow that we know won't overrun our TCAMs. And we also allow the default route. And interestingly enough, at the very bottom, we want to learn other, we want to allow specific routes that we learned from internet, the Internet Exchange to other hardware routers. Uh, with, with restricted TCAMs and the way we do that is using the that anything that was painted with the community that we mentioned earlier, the 43,760 colon 1 and colon 2, that those will be accepted and pushed into the TCAMs as well. So this is an open BGPD filter config for that purpose. So then <coughs> protecting our hardware routers TCAM from overfilling. So the way we do that is we basically say, hey, let's set a max prefix out. So thanks, Claudia, for implementing that feature. I think I asked for it years ago, and it was difficult one to, that's a difficult feature to implement because if you can imagine, you have to monitor and manage um, all the prefixes and count the tables, that, you know, the prefixes you're advertising out and withdrawing, and you have to track that somehow. So I have to say that was pretty, pretty impressive what they, you know, that feature so it looks very simple there but I'm sure it wasn't so so straightforward to implement so thank you for that um, and sorry for not testing it more for you um, the other uh, the other uh, item I just wanted to say so there's a max prefix limit out so that's what our open BGBD configuration is on the top and then on the bottom we will see uh, it's not there <laughs> Nice. So we'd have a max prefix limit on the, so <laughs> love that. So um, the Arista, on the Arista config, there's actually a missing one there. It should have uh, accept, uh, max accepted prefixes, uh, or sorry, max prefix received. Uh, and Arista's newer versions of Arista, recent versions of Arista's also have max prefix accepted. So you can actually do some filtering as well. So even if you're upstream router is sending you a load of traffic you can filter some out so you don't close the session based on them sending you loads but you can close the session based on them sending you too much that you would accept so there's two different settings and just it's important to know the difference in terms of setting this up um, it's you need to work with your transit providers uh, uh, to work with your transit providers to do this you need to get them to set up a multi-hop session uh, ask them to advertise the root, full route table plus the default route. Um, agree two loopback interfaces with them for each of your routers. And agree a static route to the first loopback and to the, via the first hardware router for the first BGP session. And agree an alternate static route for your second loopback via the alternate hardware router. That's an important point. Just for, there's no point in having redundant routers and then having the same next top. That so you're creating a single point of failure. Another thing is be careful with next hop validation, uh, because your loop your loopback they sometimes they forget to add static routes and it's it's um, uh, and so it's something you don't necessarily have to do with directly connected BGP sessions. So often it all looks fine, but it's not being selected, and the reason it's not being selected is failing next hop validation, and that happens. Uh, to, on at least a third of our ISPs that provide us bandwidth. Um, again, the normal distribution was, or sorry, the, the pool that we were surveying was three that <laughs> we had, and one of them just didn't get that concept, and you know, you're trying to explain to someone in support what's going on. Um, so just watch that one, that's the main thing. Um, and if you explain it to them like that, hopefully someone uh, will, senior enough will be listening to you on that. Um, in terms of uh, the static routes for the multi-hop sessions, here's an example where we're appearing with Hurricane Electric. So on the BGP Root Reflector 1, we route via Root Reflector 1, so you can see the purple kind of 
path that we will take. So give them routes that would allow them to create, have the inbound path via your first hardware router to your first root reflector. And then have the alternate, the diverse one, will have basically uh, your Hurricane Electric routing to your second root reflector via your second hardware router IP. So, um, so the max prefix tips, if you're more than one session between routers, I would say raise the limit slightly in one session. So the internet grows organically and it's not really cool to be protecting yourself from overrunning your TCAM tables or you know misconfigured BGP sessions. Uh, so what I would say is that if you have maybe a thousand, you know, a couple of hundred routes on a, uh, on a small peer, or you know, 10 or 20 routes on a small peer, and then maybe uh, add 50 or 100 to the second one, you're going to limit the damage quite considerably with that if it's a misconfiguration um, and it'll trip alerts all over the place. At least the first one will warn you that there's some problem. Uh, the first session going down will warn you there's some problem and it'll also give you time to remediate it without pulling down your entire um, routing infrastructure. Um, the other the other point is that, you know, so if it's just organic growth, you want, oh, why are my sessions down on my router once? Okay, oh, it's because uh, the internet table just grew by 10 and it just tripped the limit. Um, and then, you know, you're still from routing on router twos, your second branches of routers, because they have a slightly higher limit. Um, and then if it's a catastrophic failure, like someone sending you full tables and they should only be sending you 10 routes, their session's going to blow through those limits anyway. So you're still getting good protection there. Um, advanced to current sessions, all the traffic is handled by the hardware routers. We're utilizing our local exchange. Um, we use S-Flow on the switches or we can use S-Flow on the switches to sample and detect DDoS traffic. Um, and we're not having worrying about packet rates coming through our CPUs on our software routers. Um, and it's low cost compared to a full spec hardware router implementation. Um, and uh, we can also have better resilience to high packet rate DDoS because the routers can handle higher throughput. So that's kind of nice. Disadvantages, risk of black hole in traffic uh, to our default transit provider. Um, this is mitigated by the fact that we obviously learn the bigger networks um, and we also, our internet exchange traffic is not in any way restricted. Uh, or, you know, the ability to learn small routes are not restricted on our local internet exchange. Um, so it's only an issue from the prefixes from 19 to slash 24. Still an issue. Um, a more involved, it's a more involved setup. That's another disadvantage. Um, and uh, it's less fe it's flexible filtering. So no software routers in the data plane, data path. But that's... Uh, the other issues I've come across is URPF can be a challenge with hardware switches. They can have slightly different kinks, like not accepting, you know, so the, you know, the, not allowing the default, not using the default route as a valid next stop. That's an issue, um, and you don't want to be blocking traffic like that. Um, and it's not this particular setup is not useful for content delivery networks. What I mean by that is, so if you're a content delivery network, your outbound traffic is key. Your outbound traffic is uh, what, what, you know, you don't know where, who, which slash 24 on the internet is going to pull as much, much of your traffic. Uh, one of the slash 24s out of the 815,000 routes on the internet. Um, and in fair, uh, Paolo Lecende did a brilliant talk in, at an INEX meeting a few years back and uh, he was talking about working in a content provider and they did something similar like this, but they had a problem is that they're a content provider. Um, so, uh, Paolo Lecende is the author of PM account, PMACCT, and he's a great guy. I met him, I had the pleasure of meeting him, and he's very, uh, he, very affable, very encouraging, and uh, just really nice. So, big shout out to Paolo Lecende. And uh, he is actually, that talk was an inspiration, that talk, and then we actually modeled our ISP and changed our whole infrastructure based on the ideas that uh, he he discussed at that INEX meeting. And it's one of the other benefits of being at INEX, being a member of our local internet exchange, is that you actually see and meet people like Job Schneiders, like uh, Paolo Lecende. And you learn from them. Um, so in terms of running, uh, so what what he did or what they were what he was suggesting to do is run NetFlow and SFlow on the switches, 
and work out which routes are actually uh, using all that need uh, which route which destination IPs are pulling the most amount of traffic and then you check and you compare it, is the path that they're taking via the default most likely is that optimal if it's not optimal program in an exception route uh, into the hardware uh, to allow it to maybe optimally route via a different transit provider or a different internet exchange um, so that is you, you program the top destination prefixes where the default route is not the optimal path by IP exchanges or uh, better IP transit internet exchange sorry. So other ideas to improve re reliability, well I was discussing these types of things with uh, at BSD CAN with the likes of uh, Claudia Yecker and Peter Hessler. I got, hello lads, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, and I think that's one of the reasons why I love coming to BSD CAN, is you get to hang out with some pretty pretty impressive people, and they're, one, they're very knowledgeable, and two, they're very friendly, they're, they're willing to listen and willing to help you in any way they can, so... Uh, can't thank the community enough. Um, one would still want inbound traffic through the hardware routers rather than black hole the traffic like what my setup would do for the slash 19 to 24 is route them to a software router. Uh, again you're only dealing with upload traffic so uh, you still have the hardware advantage and you'd only want to do it for upload so you have the advantage of the hardware routers. So food for thought and the request for feedback. Uh, it's not an RFC, so just to be clear, and just more it's, it's discussions. Uh, I was just wondering what people thought of maybe using default plus exception routings. So you pull two feeds from transit providers um, and you select one of your transit providers, for instance, uh, and then you would different, diff the prefixes available from transit one and transit two. And then from that, you would... Um, you would see that the routes so if you say do default via transit a then what are the routes that are only available via transit b and the routes that are only available in transit b then you would program them into your switches <coughs> and then you would monitor the differences obviously continuously between those two routes those two pre uh, transit providers and then in the event of a failure of one of the transit providers or, you know, massive outage like a C-fiber cable cut, that um, you would actually be able to flip the default and then do the exceptions of the other direction. Um, and I'm just wondering what would be involved in this and what do people think? Uh, so, you know, please email me or Twitter me or, or, or even, um, you know, have a chat. I, I don't mind a robust discussion on it. I'd like to... I think it's a good idea, but then again, I, I'm not maybe not taking into account everything that maybe people who are operating bigger networks than mine might have an opinion that might be that some aspects of it. Um, what else is there? Um, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, these are paintings that my daughter Sophie Philomena Smith made for me because I'm a bit of a BSD fan. And uh, I'd like you to donate to your preferred BSD Foundation and uh, the BSD can and support the Ottawa U, um, not the Ottawa Mission, uh, for helping people who are less fortunate than us. <coughs> Again, thank you so much to Dan Langell and the team at BSD Can. Um, I, I, your work and effort has made my life better and made it more improved, so I can't thank you enough. So again, just uh, thanks everyone. Stay safe. And remember, flatten the curve. <laughs>